What makes a cricket ball swing or a football or soccer ball swerve through the air? How can solving the equations of fluid dynamics help swimmers to achieve record-breaking times? All these questions have to do with mathematics and physics in sport. And that's the topic of today's talk. I want to choose one sport in particular to explore this, and that's the discus throw. So let's explore the maths and the science behind the discus. The discus throw was among the earliest of competitive sports, with records of it going back to the 8th century BC. It was one of the events included in the ancient pentathlon, along with the stadion, a 100-meter sprint, the javelin throw, the long jump, and wrestling, held for the first time in the 18th Olympic Games of 708 BC. The object was to hurl a solid bronze disc weighing about 4 kilograms as far as possible, the longest of five attempts being taken for each athlete. The technique of rotating the body while transferring the weight from one foot to the other and sweeping the arm around in a rising arc to the point of release is partly captured in the famous statue known as Discobulus by the Athenian sculptor Myron of Alatheri. Although the original Greek bronze is lost, many Roman copies in both marble and bronze survive. The discus throw as a competitive sport was revived in the 1870s in Germany and was included in the first of the modern Olympic Games held in Athens in 1896. Shortly after, the modern technique of rotating the whole body through one and a half turns before release was introduced by the Czech athlete Frantisek Jandasuk after studying the statue of Discobulus and used by him in winning Olympic silver at the Games in 1900. Today's discus is smaller and lighter than that used by the ancients, 22 centimeters in diameter and 2 kilograms in weight in the case of the men's discus. Lens-shaped, it tapers from a maximum thickness of 46 millimeters in the center to 12 millimeters at the edge and is made of plastic, wood, fiberglass, carbon fiber or metal with a metal rim and a metal core. The competitor stands in a circle 2.5 meters in diameter, initially facing away from the direction of the throw. In the case of a right-hander, he or she then spins anti-clockwise through one and a half rotations to gain momentum before the release. To be a valid throw, the discus must land within a marked 34.92 degree sector. The reason for this seemingly strange choice of angle is that it's easy to measure out in terms of a triangle with sides that are in a simple ratio, the ends of the sector lines being connected by a third line that's exactly 60% as long. For much of the sport's history, athletes perfected the most successful methods of throwing exclusively through a process of trial and error. Newcomers learn the art by copying the techniques of leading exponents, but in recent times a knowledge of physics underpinned by maths has played a decisive role in giving athletes a competitive edge. Of crucial importance is understanding the aerodynamics of the discus. In flight, the discus becomes a fast spinning wing its rapid rotation giving it gyroscopic stability and its shape, when thrown correctly, additional lift. Key factors to a winning throw are the speed, angle, height and rate of spin upon release. The characteristic wind-up involving full use of the allowed circle, fast rotation on the balls of the feet as the athlete pivots from the back of the circle to the front, and sweeping, accelerating motion of the outstretched arm is designed to impart the greatest possible momentum to the discus at launch. The stabilizing spin, typically about 400 revs per minute, comes from rubbing against the ends of the fingers in the milliseconds before release. As well as being strong and agile, top discus throwers need to be tall so that at release their outstretched arm can reach both a good distance above the ground and a high angular momentum. 
To be stable in flight and gain the most possible lift as it flies through the air, the discus has to be tilted on release at an angle of between 37 and 42 degrees. Less than that and it will lose lift, greater and it will stall. Uniquely among track and field events, the discus throw benefits from a headwind. The spinning disc actually travels further on a moderately windy day when thrown into the wind because although its forward velocity is slightly reduced, this is more than offset by the additional lift and consequent hang time afforded by the faster onward rush of air. A higher density of air also assists lift so that lower altitudes and cooler temperatures are an advantage. Researchers at the University of Texas Institute for Geophysics found that, all other factors being equal, a discus travels about 10 centimeters further when it's a chilly 0 degrees C than on a hot summer's day at 40 degrees. At the same temperature, a discus thrown in Rome, 36 meters above sea level, will outdistance one thrown identically in Mexico City at an altitude of 2,225 meters. But of all external factors, wind velocity is king. Thrown into a 32 km per hour headwind, the University of Texas researchers found a discus will travel about 6 meters further than if thrown with a tailwind of the same speed. It comes as no surprise to learn that East Germany's Jürgen Schult had a strong breeze blowing in his face when he set a world record of 70.08 meters on June the 6th, 1986, a record that still stands today. A close look at the maths involved in all throwing events, whether discus, hammer, shot or javelin, shows that it's better to launch straight ahead than at any other angle. This is because of something called the loss formula. The distance of the throw is measured from the point where the projectile first makes contact with the ground to the edge of the throwing circle in a line that passes through the center of the circle. Launch your discus or hammer in any direction except straight ahead and a little bit of the horizontal distance traveled will be discounted because of the geometry of the situation. For example, if you throw a discus 50 meters, and it lands at the extreme edge of the permitted sector, in other words, about 20 degrees away from the center line, the distance for which you'll be credited is only 49.93 meters. While a seven centimeter loss might not seem much, it could make the difference between meddling or not in a keenly fought contest. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to get news of future videos on this channel and I'll hope to see you again very soon to discover more maths.